We've heard a lot of, uh, had good discussion this morning already about how to design and analyze genetic studies and then how to use computational methods to annotate and help to prioritize variants. And our group was uh, charged with how to take the next step or to how to apply experimental methods to identify ways in which investigators can test whether their candidate variant might have a biological effect and then what are the considerations for, um, for implementing these types of methods. I think we're, we're all clear on what the different motivations for doing functional analysis um, would be. Um, example scenarios are such as when you have a broad GWAS peak and you need to um, help narrow down the potential candidates within that region. Um, within the clinic, um, trying to understand the different um, consequences of variants that might show up um, when you don't understand the significance of those variants. Um, and then moving beyond variants, um, working to understand the function of genes that you've not previously um, characterized or seen before, um, and so developing functional assays for those genes. Um, but what um, we, we believe is the need here is that we can have a generalizable um, set of generalizable, readily accessible, and high throughput um, methods and resources that will help to um, enable the community to do functional analysis for both coding and regulatory variations. A wide range of experimental methods exist, um, and they vary both in their ease of execution as well as the um, strength of evidence that are provided by that method. Um, and so then, how do you select the most appropriate method? What should you consider? Um, I mean, one important factor is the type of variant that you're studying. Is it um, a regulatory or a, a non-coding variant or a coding variant? Um, is it um, a loss of function um, variant, for example? Another important thing to be considering is um, the context within which you, you will be testing. Um, it's known that um, the cell context, the genetic background of a, of a cell in which you're testing, um, the developmental stage uh, of the organism or the cell within your working um, may influence the outcome of your test. And with that in mind, then one of the challenges for doing this type of work is um, the access to the appropriate types of tools. Do you have samples that have the right genetic background or, or that, you know, that adequately um, imitate your, your cell context in, you know, in vitro, for example? Um, can you get customized reagents that, ref that um, have your variant within them or in the right gene? Um, and, and a lot of the techniques that we're discussing are, are fairly specialized. Um, do you have access to, to collaborators um, that can do that? And I think it, for a number of genomics investigators in particular, um, when, when you've been more focused on computational and DNA-based research, um, moving into model systems and direct um, functional testing is, is a bit of a, of, of a scary prospect. Um, and in all experimental, experimental designs, the obvious considerations are throughput, time, and cost, but this can have particular um, in influence here, um, especially, you know, you can imagine, for example, in the clinic that it, you're not going to be able to take the time to create an entire model system based on a given variant to help you interpret that variant. Um, you know, and in the case of GWAS, for example, you know, if you have thousands of different variants that have come out, it's just not pragmatic to be able to test all of them using an expensive and laborious assay. Um, so, and then another thing that we really want to emphasize in, in considering this is the weight of evidence provided by the test. Um, I think there's lots of different tests. Some of them give suggestive evidence for what, um, for you know, in support of your hypothesis, um, others um, have, are, are more demonstrative or, or strong evidence. Um, and then finally, this has come up several times today already, but um, we urge caution um, when interpreting the, the outcomes of these tests. And this is a, important for both negative results and positive results. Um, in the case of, of a negative result, as, as we talked about with context, it, you may not be seeing the effect, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your variant um, is not um, contributing to your phenotype. It may be that either your test or the setting in which you are testing is just not conducive to seeing that. Um, the, similarly, with a positive result, being able to show a biological effect that, um, you know, results fr from um, a variant doesn't necessarily mean that that biology um, is influencing the disease state in which you're studying. And so here is um, a selection of methods that we compiled, um, uh, ranging um, for a variety of different um, variant classes. 
This includes um, animal models, uh, you know, knock in or knock down, um, genome editing such as talons, um, and looking at a, some classes for loss of function alleles, um, doing knock down um, in an animal or in cell culture or cDNA complementation. Um, for splicing variants which are observed, there are a range of splicing assays that can be done in vitro, ex vivo, or in vivo. Um, and there are also, depending on the gene or protein that you're looking at, um, a number of biochemical or cellular assays that might be suited to that particular assay. Um, then looking at regulatory variants, um, it's possible to, as, as we've discussed look, with the EQTL discussion earlier, to correlate with um, gene expression. Um, either in a directed test um, with um, RNA from your, from your patient, perhaps, or by looking at reference databases. Um, and it's also possible to test this using reporter constructs. Um, and so rather than um, go through each of these methods individually and in detail, we thought what would be more useful today would be to actually show some very selected real examples of how this has been applied to genetic research um, and some of the advantages and disadvantages there. Okay, I'm going to give some perspective on regulatory variants. The functional analysis of uh, regulatory sequences began in the early 1980s, uh, followed a, uh, an interesting trajectory which uh, allows us actually to formulate uh, a proposed framework for looking at levels of evidence that a company uh, claims about regulation. And uh, th this trajectory essentially began historically uh, by using uh, uh, non-cellular assays. It moved to uh, early cellular assays um, in, in the 1980s, and then finally uh, uh, completed its, its march towards uh, what, towards trying to encapsulate regulatory function in its native context in the genome. Uh, in, in the 1990s and, and continuing on. And what I have done here is arranged uh, levels of evidence that, that recapitulate this uh, from uh, in vivo evidence from in situ models, uh, meaning that you've got uh, essentially the complete deck of cards uh, for, for or as complete as you can get it for gene regulation in its local context. Um, uh, and, and I'll give some, some examples of these, uh, and then uh, another level with evidence from artificial constructs, which of course allow higher throughput, uh, and so there are obviously trade-offs between these. But the basic idea is that there is some level of genetic data that feeds in, into it, uh, and then you can try to uh, uh, use these different techniques to assess whether the, a particular genetic variant uh, uh, is, is functional. So I'll give a couple of, uh, of examples. So with level 1A, there there actually are very, very few examples out there, uh, but probably the most famous regulatory variant and also the very first one discovered um, relates to a trait uh, which is uh, called the hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. Very simple uh, trait. You normally have glo globin switching. Your fetal hemoglobin turns off and here's, uh, you know, the time of birth pretty much goes away so that uh, in adults, if you stain fetal hemoglobin in your blood, you basically have uh, uh, none, but there are some individuals walking around which have a bunch of this in which this process didn't quite shut off. Um, and in, we can follow the scientific trajectory of this. Started in 1985, uh, this is Francis Collins here as a first author, um, with uh, the discovery of a, by looking at genetic evidence of a variant that was segregating in a family with a trait that landed in the, uh, in the binding site of a transcription factor, and this is based purely, there were two papers that appeared based purely on sequence evidence uh, and reporting that, uh, that this variant was correlated with the trait. Next up is the test, and I draw your attention to the words, is the cause. Um, and so this was actually a specific test whether this variant in an animal model could reproduce something that was close to the phenotype. And finally, uh, the, uh, this was actually tested by taking a, a huge piece of, of uh, DNA, 200 and something kilobases, engineering a single point variant in there and testing it in a model uh, of, of mice, which actually completely recapitulated in the normal case the wild type human phenotype uh, and were also able to completely recapitulate the, uh, the human trait. So that is, that's a 1A. 
Now, we're not going to go uh, into detail, but there are other ones that have appeared. This is a paper that appeared last year uh, in, in, in science, um, and this is an example of a level 1D. I, I draw your attention again to the word cause, because uh, there was causal uh, evidence, but at a different level. And this was something where in situ examination of regulatory binding uh, and, and coupled to uh, other assays was able to disclose uh, a, a very strong evidence for the cause of a particular phenotype. So I'll turn it over to Len. Okay, so I'm going to spend the next five minutes uh, focusing on some mouse studies. And I think John provided some nice examples of really uh, as close as you can get to formally proving uh, human uh, variants having an effect on, uh, on human disease. Um, what I'm going to do, I think everyone's aware of mouse knockouts. There's probably 15,000 mouse knockout lines that exist in ES cells and many of them on the hoof. And clearly, if you have a null allele in humans and you can find a specific phenotype that's also in a null in mouse, it provides functional support. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is, is uh, mouse knock-ins and then site-specific integration. Um, so there hasn't been as much uh, mouse knock-in studies where you take a human mutation and put it into the mouse, though clearly this is one line of evidence that can strongly support uh, human mutations causing disease. I just cited three examples here of people putting in uh, triplet expansions um, into, there's two papers that put it into the Huntington locus and one into the, the um, SCA1 locus. And uh, in this particular paper, there was a short, about 50, 50 CAG repeats that was put into the mouse version of the gene in the position where the human expansion occurs. And they were able to show that there was these nuclear inclusion bodies that formed in neurons of relevance to Huntington though the animals didn't get an outward phenotype. Um, a, a group later put in actually 150 repeats, so many more repeats, and these animals had many more of the, the overt phenotypes that you see in, in Huntington patients. And then finally, there, were, there was another triplet expansion that was put into the um, uh, SCA1 locus, and these animals with expansion ha had uh, profound uh, motor coordination skill defects. Um, in this particular case, all of the, the genetics behind these genes causing these phenotypes is ironclad, and so this mouse model is more or less providing a substrate for molecular experiments to be performed. But nonetheless, this is if you didn't believe these particular studies and had this kind of evidence, it could provide further support for function. Um, there also have been a few papers where they introduced point mutations. This is a paper where a single amino acid change was introduced uh, into the uh, presanilla gene. Um, and while these mice also didn't get Alzheimer's disease, at least that anyone could detect in animals, um, there were various types of, of neuronal sensitivities when challenged with uh, on various types of, of uh, substrates. And so, again, this isn't formal proof, but it does show that this point mutation does have phenotypic consequences in vivo. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about mouse site-specific integration, and not to highlight the work that we've done, but to make the important point that this is a tool that we can use, and I think it's been underused in the past. Um, this is some technology that was developed by Oliver Smithies, and I'm going to just talk about some work where, where we used this. Uh, when I was a postdoc, we found, ad identified this gene APOA5, and we showed that there were two minor haplotypes that had a, a much higher triglyceride levels in the human population than the um, common haplotype. And we also showed that if you manipulate the, the levels of this gene in animals, you can have a profound effect on triglycerides. And so it was a link from, from mouse studies to the human uh, phenotypes that we saw. But we were left with what are the variants that actually cause this effect. So we had very, very strong genetics. We had good mouse data. But we didn't know, in fact, what are the nucleotides that cause these changes. So one of the things that we wanted to do is try and put these haplotypes into the mouse system. And I'm not going to go into great de detail how this works, but the, the technology that was developed allows you to actually put your favorite gene into the same specific region of the mouse genome in the same copy number in the same orientation. So what we were able to do is build three mouse lines that had different haplotypes of this 10KB APOA5 gene. And in one case, we had the wild type version. In another case, we had seven nucleotide changes that defined this haplotype linked to human triglycerides. And then in this third haplotype, there was a single nucleotide change that had this, this uh, putative signal peptide change that we also introduced into the same site in the mouse genome. And we wanted to ask the question, well, what happens to the levels of RNA from this human gene, and what about the levels of protein that get into plasma? This gene is specifically expressed only in liver, and we know that it's an apolipoprotein uh, that functions in plasma. So we showed that, that in, if you look at the RNA from these different mouse lines, there was no differences between the three different haplotypes. But when you looked at the amount of protein that got into plasma, one of the two haplotypes that are linked to plasma triglycerides in humans had a very, very reduced level of being secreted. And we know that there was only one single nucleotide change that occurred in this particular variant. Um, and so it provided strong support, though not necessarily definitive, that this nucleotide change is likely the causal uh, mechanism by which this association manifests itself. 
So I, I wanted to highlight this to, to give people a sense that there are methodologies where you don't have to necessarily make a knock-in, but you can put your favorite sequence in a predefined position in the mouse genome. It's much easier than doing traditional uh, targeting, and then you can use these ES cells to make animals. Um, the final example I wanted to talk about is also some work that we were participated in, and this is this 9P21 in interval in coronary artery disease. This was one of the, I think, many people find uh, the greatest successes of GWAS studies where um, by looking at individuals with uh, coronary artery disease compared to controls, there was this region on 9P21 that was linked um, where a very, very common allele that's found at about 50 percent frequency in the population um, has a, a, a modest increased risk of about 30 percent if you're homozygous for this change. Um, and the interesting part was this association manifests itself independent of plasmid lipids, high blood pressure, any of the known risk factors for, for coronary artery disease. And it's also interesting in that it falls completely in a non-coding interval. There's no uh, protein encoding genes in this interval. So we knocked this particular interval out and were able to show that these two genes neighboring these cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors were dramatically reduced by getting rid of this 60 kV interval. Um, to make a long story short, we also showed that cells from heart tissue had increased proliferation due to this, these, this mutation, again, consistent with the loss of this uh, cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. But at the end of the day, when we published this work, we only could say that there was this large interval that had an effect on neighboring gene expression, but we really don't know what was the molecular nature of that particular event. So following our work, Kelly Fraser had a paper come out, and what they did is took advantage of ENCODE data a few years ago. And it's hard to see, but this red region is that coronary artery disease susceptibility region. And they were able to identify all these little red blocks, which were candidate regulatory elements based on all the information that existed in ENCODE. And what she was able to observe is that in one of these, these putative regulatory elements, there were a large number of variants, and a couple of them affected the STAT1 um, binding site. And so she went on with this information to look and showed that this particular element um, does bind STAT1 based on um, chip seek and that, that binding can mediate differences in the expression of these um, cyclin-dependent kinase. And going and looking in uh, lymphoblast cell lines, if you look at uh, risk haplotype individuals versus non-risk haplotype, um, the, the risk haplotype had a reduced level of STAT1 occupancy. And so this formulated the idea, again, that there is these uh, molecular changes and regulatory elements that occur. It's by no means definitive. Again, whether this is the exact mechanism or not is, is still unclear, but I guess it shows you the power and, and the different approaches that one could take to try and get at this information. So I'm going to shift gears and hand this over to Jay. Right. Okay. So uh, I just have a few slides on um, how the, I guess, the, the nature or the, the manner in which we collect experimental data might evolve in the future. Uh, so these are some of the motivations that I think Wendy had on an earlier slide. So we've, we've got GWAS peaks and wanting to go to causal variants, uh, dealing with functional uh, variants of unknown significance, and then just more generally transitioning from the genetics of uh, identifying a genetic finding to actually understanding the biology. And I think in one thing that's common about all of these is that we, we probably have more than we can handle with respect to the number of variants that or, or yeah, the number of variants that we would like to study experimentally. Um, relative to the uh, uh, expertise, um, capacity, and dollars to actually study them. Um, so one thing that I, I think is an increasing trend uh, that we're seeing in a number of places is thinking about high throughput or uh, massively parallel ways of assessing the consequences of variation. And you can broadly divide that into um, regulatory encoding as different methods, um, but I'm only going to talk about uh, regulatory methods. Uh, and then also observe variation or naturally occurring variation uh, versus potentially observed variation. So um, the example here, this is from some of John's work with, with ENCODE, uh, is using, essentially using ENCODE data to functionally assess observed regulatory variation in a, in a high throughput way in the sense that you're looking at lots of uh, sites at the same time. And so the particular examples here involve um, variation in chip seek signals right, so that correlate with the genotype of the individuals in which the chip seek data was acquired uh, and, and in a way that makes sense when you look at the nature of the change relative to the uh, motif binding logo that's expected for a given TF. And one of the, so one of the, I think one of the points here to distinguish this from, let, let's say, um, uh, you know, so e e e uh, classic EQT EQTLs is just that here, the implicit assumption is that, you know, we're not linked to the causal variant. You're actually measuring uh, 
this precise variant is the, the, the most likely cause and actually impacting the, the peak height there. All right, and then another uh, point from the same sort of analysis that um, came out is just as this came up earlier, um, but I, I think is a, again an important point to make is that conservation is an imperfect guide to, to regulatory function. So here, um, even looking in motifs, you get a good, pretty good AUC, but it's certainly far from a perfect predictor of, of regulatory function as, as measured um, through experimental assays. Okay. Um, go ahead. So, uh, so that, that was kind of observed variation. So one of the limitations of those sorts of approaches is that they're constrained to variation that is common, at least currently. Um, uh, another sort of tack on this, and I'm, uh, we're not the only ones sort of going after approaches like this, but I'm just using an example from us because um, I know it uh, is um, to try to think about how we assess uh, potential variants in, in massively parallel ways. So again, one could imagine doing this for coding sequences, like a, a, a clinically relevant gene of interest like BRCA1 where there's lots of variants of unknown significance, but in the example here, this, is a, 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 this will be for a regulatory uh, enhancer. And so the basic idea is that you create a library, a, a very complex library of all possible mutants and let's say all possible pairs of mutations of a, a sequence of interest like an enhancer, clone those in parallel to a vector and take this population of, of molecules and inject it into a mouse, um, uh, get RNA uh, back from the liver and then each of these, each of these uh, enhancer haplotypes, let's call them, is linked in cis to a barcode downstream of luciferase. And so you know which barcode goes with which enhancer haplotype, so you can sequence the barcodes and then use that as a quantitative metric to estimate the relative impact of individual mutations on uh, activity. So I'm going to profile. So here's an example um, with an enhancer, a liver enhancer, where um, we're basically measuring the, the relative consequences of all possible uh, single nucleotide substitutions in the enhancer in a single assay. And the other nice thing about this is um, it allows you to build um, uh, distributions of effect sizes, right? So if you think about, and I think uh, David or someone mentioned this earlier, like, you know, see your mutation has a twofold impact on expression or something like that. So what does that mean, right? Like what is, it, what is that, like how significant is that? How unusual is it that, you know, you had an enhancer, you see a variant and it causes a twofold effect. Um, and so having these sorts of uh, distributions of effect sizes allows one to, to make a more statistical judgment about how unusual um, candidate variations are in, in terms of causing bio, uh, biology. Um, so and again, just to reiterate, uh, I, I think these methods currently are, are being increasingly enabled for regulatory variation, but principle could be uh, applied to, to coding variation as well. Um, so key points just to kind of wrap up for the group, experimental data can be very useful and I think they're good examples of how it can be useful um, in a number of uh, different contexts. Uh, it's inherently a subjective exercise. No experiment is absolutely perfect um, and this is a, a difficult to quantify. Um, you know, a positive result is, as Wendy said is not causation. Uh, a negative result is not non-causation um, uh, because of context problems. And of course, multiple lines of evidence are always better. Um, and then in general, there's a need for more high throughput approaches. So uh, I guess we'll stop there. And the last slide just has some discussion questions that we can try to get answered. Thank you. Thank you much. So we've had a quartet now. This is a little, a little different. Thank you. <laughs> you guys were, were being creative. Kind of mix it up. Oh, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. No, that's, that's super. So comments? What we may want to do is, is uh, talk a bit about some of these discussion questions. That's that's useful. Okay, so could I ask a please do a specific question, which is about uh, the the trade-off between using human cell lines in experiments versus I mean they're artificial systems, obviously, but at least they're human systems versus using mouse or zebrafish models, and how you guys would consider the the trade-offs in those two cases. And they're, they're both obviously artificial in some way, but how do we evaluate which is the best approach in which phenotypic question? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we, talk, we talked about the, the you know, EQTLs and looking at expression correlation with variants as one correlative type of way of looking at things. And, and there's clearly, it depends on what the gene is doing, but you can do biochemical assays or, or gel shifts or things if you have primary cells and primary tissues. And so we had discussions about that. Um, but it, I mean, this is an area that's so hard, it's not like sequencing where you're counting beans 
this is the, there's an infinite amount of biology, and so every time we found a case that seemed good, there was also a counter counter argument for things. So, um, but de definitely, like in thinking about study designs, it, it's clear that if you have to access to tissues of relevance from patients, it can add weight to the argument you're trying to make that this is a functional relationship. Yeah. Well, I was just going to add the comment that I, that that I think it, it depends largely on the model that you have. So, for example, I mean, you can do now experiments in primary human immune cells, and for certain phenotypes, that may be an ideal model. Um, but in, and in other cases, the mouse may be able to provide a really nice physiological model that you can actually follow, which is very, very powerful. So, so I, I guess my question was uh, along those lines in the animal models. I mean, so I, you know, for the, uh, you know, the, the EQTL question that, that you know, effects of, of a certain size might be too common for that to be really a, a lot of uh, supporting information that you've got the initial association right, but you can, you know, you can actually have the same kind of concerns about many animal model um, models as well. Um, and I noticed on one of the slides it said, you know, zebrafish evidence is strong or something like that, but you can look at different traits like, you know, I study seizures and I, I guess one of the very most common no outcomes of a knockout in a mouse after lethality is seizures. And so, you know, if I pick a, a, a gene at random and knock it out, there's a very reasonable chance that it's going to have seizures. So exactly how much supporting evidence does, does that provide me? And if you think about manipulations like morpholino experiments in zebrafish, one of the most common toxicities is microcephaly. So if I'm studying a microcephaly gene and I find out that, you know, you can change the size of the fish's brain, how much does that tell you? So uh, are there, is it possible to provide some general guidance about how to think about what traits can really be informatively modeled in terms of asking the question of whether you've got a causal mutation or not in, in animal models? Did you guys get into that at all? Um, I, I think that, that <clears throat> many of, the, of, this, uh, of these choices have uh, have actually been made in some, uh, by communities out there. For example, let's say looking at uh, uh, genes that, it, that affect uh, development of the heart. I mean, congenital anomalies of the heart in human are, are extremely common. And the cardiology community has really focused and made great use of, of zebrafish models. Um, and, in fact, I mean, we, we have a paper um, with some collaborators coming, coming uh, uh, in, in cell where, where there was a new gene that was identified that was previously not known to be involved in heart development. It was highly implicated actually by using, looking at ES cells and differentiation to cardiomyocytes. And you went right into zebrafish, knocked that thing out, and sure enough, you know, it changed how, uh, how the heart develops. Um, and so I think that, and there are other models that are out there, but then some communities don't have very good models. Um, and I, I don't know for, I, I, I mean, obviously for sort of neurological phenotypes, those are the, probably the most difficult thing to, you know, the model and immunological phenotypes. I think one of the other points that we want to drive home is because there's so much question about what is the right test is, you know, for this particular trait, should, is, are you going to get more information from an animal model or are you going to be kind of get, got, got a red herring, um, that multiple lines of evidence um, is, is really going to be one of the most powerful approaches. Um, both to help you, you know, you can start with some of the less expensive approaches to narrow down your hypotheses and then move in to really understand causation. There is one, one thing, though, that, that, um, that should be considered, and that is that there is a, there's a hierarchy of logic that can be applied. And, and in the case, for example, of, of regulatory variants, uh, if it's not doing something in one kind of assay, the likelihood that it does something in a, in a, in a higher assay goes down dramatically. Um, and, and so one can actually, you know, envision, uh, for example, I mean, you know, Nancy raised this really interesting point earlier, which is that um, at the point she was raising was, let's say you knew where all the potentially functional variants or spots are in, in the human genome, we still have some issues, to, you know, to, to, to address. But, but that goal, I mean, there's a lot of momentum now towards creating that, that uh, baseline map there. And I think that that is uh, something that can feed into these higher, these higher choices, but it definitely narrows your prior probabilities for sure. The concern about creating that baseline is that, you know, everything is doing something somewhere at some time in human development. And, you know, and that, I think we really do face that that's where we'll end up heading. And so then it becomes less informative. I mean, I, I think it, I, but 
the issue is that you have another layer that you can put on that that makes things much, much more useful, and that is that we're not looking at the genome as a single, a simple one-dimensional entity that, you know, this thing is functional, that's functional, but you're looking, but already you're you're assaying that function in a cellular context. So we know that this base is functional in, you know, Th17 T cells, for example. And that suddenly changes very significantly how you, how you may use that information. <clears throat> I'm sort of curious, so, so for the for very small families with rare diseases, it seems like this is the gold standard. We talked this morning about the fact that it's difficult to make a genetic argument when you don't have enough numbers. So who, who decides what's sufficient to use this when it's the primary method of, of proving that something is, um, is causative for a disease or, or pathogenic? Should that be journal editors? Should that be the field in general? Should that be specialists? I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. I mean, I think it, it's not a black and white answer. I think the, the more specific the, the phenotype uh, and the rarer it is, the more power you can put, put behind it. But there's never going to be that black and white. You always can get burned, and people have been burned in many publications where they have a genetic finding and then they follow it up with something that's either in human cells or in a mouse. It all fits together, and then next thing you know, someone comes in and does a follow-up study, and the initial genetic study was weak. The functional data was was consistent with, but but wasn't causative, and, and it's just the nature of... Uh, how much confidence can you have when you publish a paper? And it, it is hard with one family and one functional assay, and it, it, I think you have to always be cautious. But I don't think there's a black and white answer because, again, there's so much biology and each system is going to have its own caveats. I, I think there is a problem out there, though, in terms of claims of causality. So I, I highlighted in a couple of those uh, articles I put up just the use of the words cause. Um, in, in, in those cases where it's more justified. But that caused me to actually do a little searching in the, in the literature, and which turned up a shocking number of papers which, uh, had, which were claiming causes in, in the titles, and they were all over the map in terms of the type of evidence um, that they were providing. So some standardization of that, which can be certainly enforced at the level of, of journals, uh, would be very useful. I think there. Oh, sorry, I think there is increasing pressure whenever you publish a, a novel genetic finding to have functional um, data to support that. But it, as we, we highlighted here, I think it would be very helpful to have some standards and guidelines set up for what that is. Now, it's not going to be the same for every gene or every disease, but some guidelines for what's an appropriate level of evidence. Because I, I tend to think that you can you can show a biological effect for almost anything if you try enough tests under enough conditions. I just wanted to pick up on a comment that Len made that um, this idea that if you, if you publish, say, the, a genetic finding and it doesn't quite meet some burden of causality, but then some other group goes ahead and does a functional follow-up, which then adds to that and the sort of combined evidence suggests that you have found a causal variant. And I was just made me think that do we need to have some kind of a framework or a form of words that, because you have this sort of balance between you want to put that not quite definitive genetic thing out there so people can follow it up, but you also want to avoid some of the things we talked about before, putting things out that are so speculative that postdocs waste their entire lives following up a finding that essentially is false. And how do you find that balance? So I think if you say, oh, we're only going to say things that are, you know, completely and totally known to be causal, then that's, you know, a set that's basically empty. So you want to, to keep putting information out there, but don't want to run the risk that people coming at it from a different angle who don't, who maybe can't in, interpret that, that conditional statement as critically end up sort of pursuing it when it turns out to not really be true. And I think there are, there are some mixed messages in the group as a whole about uh, how we trade off functional information and statistical support. I mean, we hear... So we've heard, you know, functional data certainly shouldn't be used as a substitute for compelling statistical support. So, and we've heard, and this is clearly true, that weak statistical evidence and weak functional evidence doesn't combine together magically to create a strong case. But, but, we, but at the same time, it is clear that functional data does provide some additional evidence that will occasionally push things over the line. I, just, I was just wondering if we could maybe try to clarify that point a little bit more. Like, how exactly are we thinking about combining these forms of data? Oh. So one, I mean, I think just along the lines, I think that uh, the comments were made already. I think the specificity of the functional assay, which is often not 
really tested or provided in in the in the when people provide functional data. In other words, if you were to pick, you know, the ten genes that are you know e almost equally likely to be candidates, or some set of ten random genes, or maybe ten genes that are expressed in the right organ system or something like that, how many of them, if you tried equally vigorously on those, and of course you have to, people have to really try equally vigorously, uh, would show a similar functional, you know, assay. So you can, in some sense, almost get like a p-value, not for the assay itself, you know, like the luciferase was up with a p less than, you know, 10 to the minus 6 because you did the assay 100 times, but, you know, a p sort of based on picking genes at random out of the genome how often would you expect to get that? And that's the sort of data that I don't think we have for most functional assays because, of course, it's hard enough to do the one gene that you're interested in and, you know, to then say, okay, we'll now do it 99 more times so we can get an empirical p-value. But in some sense, that's kind of what you need. Well, I mean, uh, David, I guess, made a very similar point. And the, the thing is, for some, in the case of knockout mice, for instance, we do actually have some empirical data where there are hundreds of knockout mice that have been generated, and we do know what is the frequency of seeing epilepsy in those cases. There's ascertainment bias there, I guess, but even so, you could you could actually come up with some estimate based on those. Uh, but, I mean, is that is that a recommendation that we'd like to make, is to consider consider the outcome of a functional assay in the context of... The, the world of experiments that have been done on other random genes throughout the genome of that type? Yeah. Either admit that you don't know anything about it um, or to say that there's some data, but just to be explicit about it, absolutely. Yeah. No. No. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to take the converse point of view. Um, you know, I. I'm a human geneticist, and, and I firmly believe that mice are not little people, um, that they look kind of different. Um, and they certainly have very different biochemistry. So there are several very well-described human disorders where you knock the gene out in the mouse, and the mouse has no phenotype, or occasionally has a different phenotype um, because they have different biochemical pathways, they have a different immune system, they have a different gut, they're exposed to different bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think one of the converse conversations we need to have is, do we need proof in an animal system or a non-human system? It seems to be that, you know, to get to, to nature or science, you need to have this kind of a, a level of proof for a new gene. But if you, if you don't, you, you kind of go down a couple of notches in the journal. And, and I think that there may be, there isn't the data out there to show how often a phenotype that really causes human disease is not recapitulated in the animal model. And, and I think that kind of negative data is sometimes almost as important because I, I can think of several postdocs that have wasted their career trying to get a mouse model to really look like the human when it, it doesn't. Um, and so I think we have to think of the converse. With, with all of the animal models we're talking about, there are legitimate biological reasons where they may not recapitulate the human phenotype, but mutations in that gene may cause the bona fide human disease. And so I think we have to think about that negative side as well. So I, I had forgotten Nancy, um, and I have Suzanne. So, so Suzanne, okay. you want to speak to? Yeah. Okay. What I wanted to, about publishing results that are not conclusive, I, I think we're also working kind of against human nature here because, and I really don't have an answer for this list, but I think we have to take this into consideration, that people tend to oversell results. They like to ignore things that don't support their results. And I mean, it can be conscientious, they can conscientiously doing, they can do this and know they're doing it or not know they're doing it. And I don't, I don't really see how a way to get around this problem. I mean, one way would be almost just reporting kind of like a checklist or I think people feel that th they've worked hard on something and they have a lot in, uh, in stake and they would rather publish it in a higher impact journal than a lower impact journal. And that's just human nature, but we really have to get around this problem of people not presenting everything and just presenting subsets of what they saw. The, the point I was going to make, um, so David appreciates because perhaps seizures is a fairly obvious phenotype. David can appreciate that in the knockout for many genes, um, they, seizures are observed. But, there, but of course, many of the phenotypes that we are interested in studying are simply not measured when 
when people are looking at their knockout model for this or that. And so, you know, when we, you know, people have now looked at a number of genes implicated for type 2 diabetes from GWAS studies, knockouts and conditional knockouts, you're often seeing um, sort of super insulin sensitive animals, um, you know, you, so, so they're, they seem to be um, resistant to development of diabetes even on high fat diets. But, you know, they're a little bit smaller, they're a little bit leaner, and that's true for many kinds of knockouts. And so it may not be sufficient to just compare them to their wild type litter mates. We may need to look more carefully at, well, you know, what do glucose traits look like in knockouts for, for epilepsy? I mean, I, we, we don't usually accumulate that kind of information, and so it's much harder to interpret um, the specificity of the apparent effects that we're seeing. It's, it, it works in both directions, I'm afraid, or sometimes fails to work well in both directions. I, I think these are they're excellent points, and, but I, I think that there's two different levels of the conversation here. There's, there's the organismal level, where, which is largely geared towards the evaluation and testing of particular individual genes in, in some system. And then there's the, the low-level question of, is this variant actually doing something? Because to get to the organism le, uh, organismal level, you know, at a lower level, I mean, can you see actually using some, you know, more more low-level functional assay uh, that, that's doing something. In the case of regulatory variants, we have that assay. I mean, if you have, if you're not, I mean, you know, regulation all drains down to effectively to proteins binding. And, and, and if that's, and if you can see that effect, if you don't see that effect in the, in, in the right spots, the likelihood that you're going to go farther, it, it doesn't make sense. Now, what it also raises, though, is a, is a different kind of question, which I, I suppose it applies to the organismal level as well, and that is that, you know, genes are not functioning in, in isolation. They're functioning in systems. And what if it's really the combination of the following, you know, variants or the following variant in X genetic background that gives you, you know, the effect? And that, that's something that's very, very hard to, you know, to address right now, certainly. Along those, along those lines, I would just uh, many, many assays that are being used nowadays play, really pay not too much attention to things like kinetics. So uh, regulatory assays involve affinities, protein binding assays involve affinities, and you can get something to show a phenotype uh, if you have the concentration of the reactants way off physiological. That doesn't mean that in the physiological circumstance it's actually going to do anything. That's well shown in classic enzymology, for example. So, and I think it's probably more of an issue for complex traits where the variants are likely to be more subtle. And um, so those are all user beware caveats. So I just wanted to make a very quick comment to what David Dimmick said most of the papers which I handle at Nature and that are being published don't have any mouse knockout associated with them. In fact, it's extremely rare that the genetics papers that I see do that. that. So that's not necessarily um, required. But um, I wanted to come back to something that Daniel said, you know, this kind of stereotypical example when you have weak statistical evidence and weak functional follow-up. Now, of course, that's a kind of cartoon example of a paper. But what's more interesting to consider is what if you have weak statistical evidence and ostensibly strong functional data, or conversely, strong statistical evidence and then weak circumstantial follow-up. So how, how do we feel about this? Are any of those two useful? Okay, you obviously think they're not, but maybe. I mean, I, I, so I was just going to make a comment, you know, so I, I think one of the goals today is to come up with some guidelines or something constructive for the community. Um, and just kind of genetic evidence at least has the advantage of you can, you can put a number on it, right? Uh, with, I think no matter what with, with experimental evidence, it's always going to be a subjective decision with lots of domain-specific knowledge that is entirely dependent on reviewers to kind of judge is this strong, weak, or middle, middling evidence, right? But I can imagine something that sort of tried to connect 
com combinations of experimental and, and statistical evidence or genetic evidence and, and experimental evidence to the use of certain terminology, right? So, you know, John's complaining about the over usage of causal, right? And there's other words like implicated and associated and, you know, weakly implicated, strongly implicated. And I'm not sure what the appropriate terminology is, but I f it, does seem, it, it does seem rational to come to some sort of decision about what what it means to say something that is strongly implicated, whether that strongly implicated could be weak genetic, weak genetic evidence and overwhelmingly great functional evidence, right? Or, you know, other combinations kind of thing. But so, I don't know if that answered your question, but. No, I, I think so. this is something that was, that sort of was left, you know, untouched in our, in our presentation, but, but it was implicit in many of the, uh, uh, certainly in the examples that I presented, is that there, there was an input of very, very strong genetic data. And in, in the sense that you had a trait that was segregating. And more, it wasn't just that, that it wasn't just pure genetic data. Uh, in one of those cases, so for example, that, that second example I, I showed, oh, it's way, it's way, way back there now, but um, the, I'm sorry? All right. This one. So this has, this had no knockouts, no mice, but what it did have was a molecular phenotype that you could measure in people. So people with a model organism here, you could measure and see that they were producing these different transcripts, at different individuals in a family, and then using the in situ methods of finding protein binding, et cetera, one could resolve a compelling molecular mechanism that explained the thing that you're measuring varying in individuals. And so I think this, that, that, that this is, you know, part of the combination that Magdalena was talking about, that you have that, you know, very strong genetic or sort of measure, phenotypes that are measured precisely in humans can, can definitely potentially lower the level of evidence that you need on the other side. So, so the, the way I think about the answer to Magdalena's question is that if there's clarity in the paper about what the authors think, you know, is carrying the story, then you know exactly what it is that you have to have them explain. So, um, for example, it, it might be the case that you have very, very weak genetic evidence. Um, you know, got interested in this variant because I saw it in one person. Um, but you put that, you knocked it into a zebrafish and found that um, they didn't make T cells and you were studying a primary immunodeficiency. And then the authors could say, it is this functional assessment that is making the case and you can believe it because we know the sensitivity and specificity of this particular assay. We know, for example, I mean, I don't study this, I'm just sort of making this up, but it's probably not far from right. We know that um, that's not a really common outcome of, of knock-ins in, in a zebrafish, right? So, you know, that's not, a, that's not that, for example, that's not a really well-known toxicity and so on. That's a very specific outcome. And it's also the case that in, when you study, mutations that are, you know, responsible for primary immunodeficiencies involving, you know, T-cell defects, when you study those in zebrafish, they have problems with their T-cells. And so you can actually say, in this case, the functional assessment is very, very convincing for those reasons, and then you accept it. And if you tried to make a story like that out of whatever the heck you were doing to a variant that was associated with schizophrenia, you wouldn't be able to make a, st a story like that up. So at least you actually have required the authors to explain the basis for a relatively strong conclusion. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that that's exactly right in that um, in some sense the two parts of the question, they're really two separate parts of a, of a broader story and it goes back to, to Greg's nice characterization of the genetic evidence is in some sense about is this mutation pathogenic and the functional evidence is about is this mutation damaging and, you know, the full picture, the beautiful picture is that it's damaging and pathogenic and maybe deleterious too depending on your phenotype. but you can have a, you know, a true and worthwhile piece of work that sort of proves one part of that or the other part and only can imply uh, the second piece. And, you know, basically exa exactly echoing what David said, that, you know, it's a question of what the authors are, how much of the story the authors are claiming they've proven. And I think, you know, if one part of it is weak, then you can't let them get away with trying to just kind of, because the evidence of the other part is strong enough to steamroll through and say, and therefore it must be the disease-causing thing too, because that bit is still open to debate. We put up uh, 26. I thought it might be useful just to remind. Mike, can you can you put up number 26? 26. I, I thought it might have come up till now, and it may be about to come up. So if I steal anyone's thunder, I'm sorry. But um, in microbiology, there's a very uh, well recognised uh, series of postulates from 
a guy called Koch or Koch or, and <laughs> David, I can read them if no one else has. But um, <laughs> David Relman uh, wrote uh, more recently. It's also, it was kind of incorporated into epidemiology. So I think epidemiologists and I guess microbiologists and others have thought about what defines causality for, for quite some time. Uh, and, and these are kind of, it's relevant, I think, to a number of different things that we say, what, because they've addressed as a community what makes a causal association. And in this case, it was a causal association between uh, a, a bacterium and the disease, but I think it's relevant for our variant versus disease. And it may be familiar to, to everyone in the room, but this was... Uh, oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> there we go. And so these are sort of standardly uh, always... Uh, put together by epidemiologists whenever there's, there's a suggestion that there may be a causal relationship in order to define them. And so a number of these obviously uh, reflect things we've been talking about, um, plausibility, it, you know, experimentation analogy, but dose is response also relevant from a genetic dose uh, perspective. So it may be, this may be a useful framework for, I mean, we've talked about most, many of the things here, but this may be a useful framework for us to start to think about uh, genetic causality across this uh, experimental to uh, clinical uh, uh, spectrum. It's funny that, uh, that it looks like that the reference is originally from, it's from 1965. Yeah. And yes. So the, these are the Bradford Hill criteria. They're, they're, they're classic in epidemiology, and they were actually used for, for demonstrating a causal association of smoking to, to lung cancer and death, because you can't do that experiment. But, but if you, read, the, if you, you know, read through them and think about applying them to candidate gene studies in the 1990s, you know, people obviously just didn't pay attention to the fact that there was a well-established, you know, logical way of thinking through this. They just decided they didn't want to do it. It wasn't convenient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I think in many regards we, we have addressed these even though we don't always say that we do. Um, so, so strength of association, I think, you know, people look at odds ratios and say, and that's what, what Hill meant by, by that, you know, if you have a five-fold, it's much stronger than a one-and-a-half-fold. And, and dose response, we have been looking at, you know, number of alleles or number of uh, variants that, you know, sort of combine together, as it, as it were. Temporality has always been difficult in genetics because you have it from conception. So, so how, how do you, and, and it would be very interesting to, to, you know, have some thoughts about how one looks at temporality. Obviously, development is one way of, of considering that, but, but there, there may be other, other ways as, as well. Um, so, so, yeah, so I think, we, you know, we are sort of getting at this, but, but there are other aspects in, in genetics that may not fit quite well into that. It'd be nice to know what those might be. Actually, there's, there's new ones, you know, because for strength of association, actually, if you do a small study and you have a false positive finding, it's quite likely to have a very large odds ratio. You know, it, there's a very strong correlation between reported odds ratio in complex disease studies and sample size. No question. And, and it's, you know, it's unfortunate that they're listed in that order because that's probably not an appropriate, um, I mean, that's, that's sort of the order of strikingness of, to people. They go, oh my goodness, it's 20-fold, it must, it must be real. But, but you're absolutely right. And, and so, so, you know, one could weight these a little bit more. Uh, so I, I would argue against a direct analogy with epidemiology because I think our problem is much simpler in a sense. Because in epidemiology, uh, if you have A and B it may, and, and they correlate, it may be that A causes B or B causes A or there is a C which causes both A and B. In genetics, if you have genotype and phenotype, usually unless your phenotype is willingness to work in high radiation environment or something like this, um, we believe that cause, uh, causality flows from genotype to phenotype. So a, a lot of the uh, problems uh, addressed by epidemiologists are not really relevant to, to, to our case. And uh, I, I think we're in much simpler, much simpler environment here. But, but I think the framework of, of thinking about these multimodality approaches to, to causal evidence and, and needing more than one from one from each, you know, meeting several from several different boxes. Maybe it's two from five or four from seven. I think that model is one that could be useful to us. Yeah. I think it, at least it pertains to experimentation. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, David, Dumas. So I'm, I'm going to come back to this issue of experimentation. I, I think there were there are a bunch of laws and rules that kind of prohibit mutagenesis of humans. It's kind of discouraged. Um, and so I think most of the time when we're looking about animal experimentation, we're actually talking about plausibility. 
I think we have to understand the difference between proving something happens in an animal versus proving it happening in a human. So I, I think animal experiments have a huge value in, in kind of the plausibility arguments, but I don't think they are the same as, as a true experimentation of controlled manipulation in a human. I wonder, we have a, a couple of minutes, and, and Wendy had a wonderful slide at the, at the beginning of, of your talk, and Mike, maybe you could can, you can re-switch, um, that had a, a table, I love matrices, and so, so you had this nice matrix that had, you know, whether something was strong, suggestive, or whatever, what kind of a, uh, you know, what particular experimental evidence was um, uh, relevant to, to what particular kind of variant, do you remember that? This one. So would we have a moment maybe to, to talk a bit about, you, you had identified several that were strong here and several that you feel are suggestive. Does everyone agree with, with those that, that, you know, the knock-ins or the genome editing, et cetera, are, are very strong? Or, or should there be more than two classes of evidence was another thing we struggle with. Um, also, I, I don't know if small molecule, I mean, it's early days in small molecule work, but are the small molecules up here? In that it's potentially a cellular assay, but sure. it's definitely a specific kind, it's true. I think you do have to take into account what David was saying earlier when you start with mouse or zebrafish knock-in with the specificity of the phenotype. And I, I would not agree categorically that the first kind of data are strong. I think there's, there's nuances to that, important nuances that uh, I've seen lots of, uh, we, the term we use for the zebrafish is brain rot. Um, we see it all the time. Um, and when you're studying CNS phenotypes, if you see a zebrafish knocked down with brain rot, it really doesn't mean much of anything. And so if they have, you know, fins coming out of the wrong part of the body, you never see that. And it's like, wow, that's significant. So uh, it can be extremely strong, and it can be damn near meaningless, too. So do you have a suggested term we might use there, a variable maybe? It's situational? I, I think it would be better to have just strong with an asterisk, right? Because, mm. I mean, I, I, at some level you have to make, there, there is a difference between correlation with expression and, and mouse models, right? That, that's a real difference. And, but by the same token, I can think of some of the things where we haven't suggested, like biochemical or cellular assays for a metabolic defect where it's actually really strong evidence, right? So I think there will always be exceptions to every category, but, and we should note that, but. Um, yeah, I, I think this gets um, to a very, I think it's an obvious point, but, um, you know, we have assays that, that act on molecules, that act on cells, tissues, and organisms, and we're in this tight spot where the things that act at organisms, if you can really reliably connect them to DNA, it's, it's kind of a miracle. Uh, right? But there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts on the way up that hierarchy, and there's a lot of potential noise, and it's why it's a miracle, is because it has, pers per that, that signal has uh, continued despite all of these uh, assaults on it. And so I think one way to talk about this is that sometimes we're lucky in that, in some of the cases that we heard earlier, it's an enzymatic thing where the molecular assay is extremely close to the organismal response because it kind of almost jumps right up to the organism, whereas other things like schizophrenia and diabetes and depression are incredibly integrative and therefore the molecular, cellular, even tissue level may not be as compelling. So I would advocate thinking about these kinds of assays with that kind of rubric because, you know, if you have an integrative phenotype that you see in the mouse, that might be great but um, it might not be great in the, in the context of other phenotypes of interest. And so that's where this asterisk that Jay was suggesting, for me, it's, the, it's all about the asterisk, and that's why I was trying to. I mean, would, would that be solved by just saying in the context of a well-defined phenotype? No, no, because it's not just whether the phenotype's well-defined, it's a, the specificity question. Um, so, so we had Heidi and Joel, but, but David, if you're going to speak directly to that point. Yes. Yeah. So I just, I, I, I think we should be really careful about not saying strong there, even with an asterisk. And I, you know, and the reason is that if we think a little bit about how people act in terms of trying to publish papers, if we make a statement that, you know, mouse or zebrafish knock-in is strong, even if we asterisk, asterisk it, then people are going to refer to that when they're trying to fight for their claim in their papers, exactly like we've already seen for the 10 to the negative 8 p-value threshold for GWAS. So what a lot of people, I think, have seen, like I've seen in review, that authors will 
say, no, it's a real finding, even if it's like association with pol political party affiliation or whatever, because the p-value is 10 to the negative 8. And look, in McCarthy et al., if, if you have 10 to the negative 8, it's real, okay? That's what it says in the paper. And then, so you say, well, look, but there's been thousands of GWAS studies done now, so in fact, even if we have 10 to the negative 8 for every study, you know, you're going to get some false positives. No, the authors still refer back to that and say, that is what's said in the community. And so if it's better than that, then it's, it's significant. And so stuff actually gets through that way. So I think we have to be really careful not to say, look, if it's, if it's in a zebrafish, it's good evidence, and leave it at that with a little bit of comics. People are going to refer to it. They're going to then say, I've done something to the zebrafish, and therefore it's real. So I just going to be really careful about not doing that. Good point. So we, we ought to wind up. So we had um, Heidi and then Joel. So I was just wondering if there's any utility in putting in another column that refers to what kind of conclusion you would make if you got a negative result on any of these approaches. You know, speaking to the question of can you exclude, you know, a role because it didn't show a phenotype or it didn't show, and, and you know, some of this speaks to the comments earlier about we never see the negative data, never gets published, and, and so, you know, when can you actually make inferences from that data versus when it's not safe to do that? I don't know if that's useful or not. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point, um, and we'll have to deal with it. I mean, splicing is sort of one where I might conclude a lot if I didn't see any aberrant splicing um, in, a, in an assay, but many of the others, for all the context reasons we discussed, I think there's always, you can always make a story why a negative result so, doesn't support. I would argue that actually you, you would not reject a clear genetic finding for, for not finding function with any of these assays. You know, you could always speculate that it's in a different context. Also, you know, just, just for interest, you know, Mark yesterday had this binding example, right? You know, very, varying levels of genetic evidence were published at, at many different times by many different people. It turns out there's also, you know, a whole literature of the, this binding mouse, you know, saying if you knock out this gene in the mouse, you get schizophrenia-like phenotypes. You know, obviously, you, you know, we could argue about whether a schizophrenia-like phenotype in the mouse is convincing or not. but. You know, but you, you, you would have both sides. You'd have, you know, some genetic evidence and you would have, you know, the mouse model claiming to support it. So I think, I think Daniel wanted to make a comment. Do you, do you want to let Joel? No, no, you, you yield the floor to, to the gentleman from, uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think, I think it's been pretty well covered by Gonzalo. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Great. Good discussion.